even drilling down a little farther, when we've taken a look at just um, certain specialties, for example, the general specialty, we've seen an average of 32 vendors in just that specialty alone. And again, think about that as you're, as, as you're a technician needing to find the IFUs, follow the IFUs, make sure you know the variation between different vendors. It can be uh, pretty onerous. In the midst of constant commotion in the healthcare industry, one unified voice rises above the rest, a beacon bent on vanishing biofilm. They are sterile processing professionals who clean and sterilize their way to improved outcomes, and their patient safety victories often go unseen. This is Beyond Clean, the central nexus for the people, processes, and products that are pushing the sterile processing industry forward. Join us every week as we give voice to that global force fighting dirty all around the world. It's time to go beyond clean. Brian Stewart, CCS VP, has 26 years of experience in the medical field with over 13 years of operational experience in an FDA-regulated environment as a third-party reprocessor of surgical linens and instrumentation. Brian has extensive experience in hospital supply chain management and delivery of durable goods, custom procedure trays, and surgical supply single pull products ranging from bulk just in time and offsite prepared case cards. For the last five years, he has provided consulting services to hospitals to improve processes and instrument tray streamlining. And Jay Schrader leads a team of passionate and creative marketers that seek to understand the needs and challenges of today's healthcare professionals so that they can create and deliver a portfolio of product and service solutions to help customers meet their daily challenges within sterile processing. Jay has 11 years of experience within the global medical device space with a broad and diverse background that spans across both clinical and sterile processing areas. His background includes product development, FDA 510K submissions, product lifecycle management, key opinion leader development, clinical trials, and patient outreach. Jay attends local Amy meetings and is active in developing healthcare purchasing news articles. And Mike, this was really the one that stood out to us from the Isham Annual Conference and Expo. Some great stats that we're going to discuss with the listeners today for anybody who wasn't able to attend. Yeah, Justin, you know, this is one, and actually this was the last uh, concurrent session at Isham. And, you know, I I know all of us, we had been on the vendor floor all day long. We had gone to, you know, all the other concurrent sessions. I will be honest, I almost skipped this one because I was so tired. But when we actually went in and they started rolling out these numbers, you know, it was like lights going off. You know, and everybody in the room was really just kind of eating it up. And we we kind of all were there and we looked at each other and we said, we have got to get these guys on the podcast to talk these numbers, because honestly, there's only about two or maybe 300 people in the room. We need to get this information out to a lot larger audience than that, because these are important things that are being discussed right here. Well, I will say just as one quick add on that there was a hospital administrator who had attended the conference and was part of this debate and really felt that these numbers represented a great deal of opportunity for improvement. I think we can all agree on that. As a reminder, you can subscribe to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We can also be heard on the Sterile Education app, available on iTunes and Android. Follow Beyond Clean on Twitter, at Beyond Clean Info, Facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast, LinkedIn.com slash Company slash Beyond Clean, or Instagram, Beyond Clean Podcast. Find our videos, including Fighting Dirty with Hank Balch, Real Talk with Bob Mars, and Beyond the Headlines with Mike Matthews at youtube.com slash beyond clean. Beyond Clean also offers social media and podcast consulting for vendors, along with 
survey preparation and remote consulting services to hospitals, surgery centers, and clinics. For more information, email info at beyondclean.net. Finally, Beyond Clean is moving to a new format for issuing CE credits for our podcast. Beginning this season, we will be certifying the entire season of eight episodes all in one. That means just one quiz at the end of the season for all the credits on one certificate. We'll be right back after a short break. You're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Jay Schrader, Marketing Director, and Brian Stewart, Director of Consulting Services, Field Operations with Asculap. Jay, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, my pleasure. And Brian, you as well. Great information to share with our listeners today. Yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. So let's start because the big reason we wanted to have you on the show or what drew our attention was a presentation of some very interesting data and statistics at Isham's annual conference and expo. And I know not all of our listeners are able to go to the annual conference. And so we wanted to bring this to our general audience as well because it really spawned a great discussion at issue and probably one of the best discussions at some of the presentations that I had seen. So why don't you introduce everybody to Asculap and really how this project came about? Sure. So this is Jay. Asculap is a, it's an old company, 150 year old global manufacturer of rigid sterile containers, full line of surgical instruments, as well as visual systems and surgical asset consulting. And so that kind of leads right into the second part of your question on how the project came about. And it really came about through the result of years of experience uh, observing things in the SPD or the sterile processing department. I always like to point out that while we've been manufacturing for over 150 years, we've also been reviewing quality issues that come about during almost the same amount of time. So that's a lot of experience and a lot of time. And during this time, we've had a lot of questions from customers regarding instrument quality, the effects of water and steam and maintenance on instruments, as well as really getting familiar with how inventory is managed. We've not only sold millions of instruments worldwide, but we've experienced where they live and the conditions in which they live in, in countless hospitals. So that really has taken a lot of all that experience and has really led into what our desire is, is just get that word out and help customers. And over the past 20 years in Europe and the last 10 years in the U.S., we've observed many things during our consulting work, which is going out and looking at these things and then offering solutions. A lot of these things that we've observed and what you've experienced that we've talked about at Isham were things that were essentially invisible to customers. We often refer to that as the invisible surgical crisis. But things like instrument quality issues, inventory imbalances, process of improvements that can be made, sterile packaging assessments, even the need for audit preparedness. And at the end of all that, after all these observations have been made, and and as you said, some can be very surprising, we wanted to get the word out and start the conversation. And the presentation opportunity at Isham was a great forum to do so. Yeah, so obviously this was a huge project, and as the entire Beyond Clean crew was there uh, listening to you guys present, you know, this was something that immediately we just were listening to and said, man, my goodness, we have got to get these guys on the podcast to talk about this. So I thought what we would do for this particular podcast is do something very similar to what you did uh, in the Isham presentation was we're going to throw the number out there and you guys are going to take the number and run with it. Very similar to how it was done at Isham. Again, you know, like Justin said, not everybody's able to be there. So we're going to give kind of everybody a, a little taste of what that was like. And so I'm going to start out by throwing this number out there. And, uh, you know, Brian, why don't you run with this one? Uh, the number is 35%. Tell us why that matters. Well, 35% is on average the number of percentage of trades processed with an inventory higher than one. In the U.S., Utilization rates are 20% or less. Way too much inventory. Uh, this does not address, you know, the number of sets that are requested and not even used. So all that activity, both in reprocessing, preparation for a case, case setup, and case breakdown, is driven by 65% of waste. Yeah, and I know um, our chief medical officer, Peter Nickel, who you've come to know since this presentation, 
has talked a lot about a self-study that he wound up writing an article on, which led it to his first appearance on this podcast. But he was saying that number, even for himself, was as low as 11% and might only and might even be as low as 20% if you consider all surgeons um, at his institution. So those numbers, pretty convincing. I almost think your number is generous compared to some situations, but that's the reason why you pull data from a large data set. Correct. And, and again, this is looking at it as an aggregate across all disciplines. Uh, we've seen utilization as low as, as 6 to 7% for specialized services with a large physician population. So that, that number can vary, to your point, uh, quite significantly across an organization. Let's go to 29%, the next statistic here. This is the max utilization for instruments in a set. And let's go to Jay. Yeah, so 29% is the max, and that's an average max of utilization of instruments and trays that we have seen. The rates that we have seen, um, interestingly enough, really do kind of line up with some of the white paper uh, support range that's out there. We've seen a range from 2% to 74 and again, with that max um, utilization, meaning <laughs> the maximum amount of the instruments of 29%. The white paper support range is 13 to 75. So we were really, I'd, I'd say not surprised, but you know, how to have it fall in the same range really tells us that, um, you know, something, something solid out here is going on with this, with this data. The one thing I did want to mention is, you know, when you really look at this, um, 100% of the instruments that are in the trays, they're required to be reprocessed. So, um, there's no, there's kind of no savings if you don't use them all, right? There's, uh, there, there's more of a, of a cost implication there. Yeah, and you bring up a, a great point with the white paper that was discussed. Uh, I think uh, primarily the one that most people have in mind is the University of Chicago study. And uh, I mean, these numbers are right in line with that University of Chicago study that that was determined. If I remember correctly, utilization was somewhere in about the 19% range. But it seems like between your guys' study, our own, you know, Dr. Uh, Peter Nichols study, and then your study, all these numbers are coming out, generally speaking, in about the same range where it's in the neighborhood of less than 30% utilization. So, you know, the title for this podcast is the numbers and why they matter. And so I want to break this down. You've already mentioned one area where it matters, which is, you know, the worker cost. But uh, what are some of the other costs? Like, I know the obvious costs are the cost of the instruments themselves. So it, it, generally speaking, in a hospital, you know, what does 65% or 70% waste of instruments look like in terms of cost now are you asking in cost of acquisition maintenance or processing yes <laughs> let's look at all of them <laughs> from an acquisition perspective you know there's a lot of savings that can be had or what i'd call cost avoidance moving forward within a facility you've already made the investment because uh, one of the things that we've seen with looking at some of these data points is and i may be jumping ahead and i apologize if i am but utilization of sets when you have so much instrumentation tied up into your primary trays that's not being utilized, could that be redeployed or reallocated to sets that you're same-day turning or same-day processing to meet surgical need uh, and eliminate that non-standard work with just re redeployment of, of assets? Uh, you send a tray out for repair. They can't just repair the 29% that's being utilized. They, they have to inspect and repair that entire set. Uh, same thing with the replacements. Uh, you have an instrument that's lost. If it's not part of that 29% that's being utilized, you're still going to replace that, and there's there's cost associated with it to make the tray complete. So all that activity ties into the direct cost. Now, your indirect cost could be could you downsize the footprint of your trays uh, to create more space in sterile storage, uh, lighten up the weight of the trays to make it easier on your employees to to handle for the staff to set up in the OR. How much time does it take to set up? Those types of factors would definitely uh, be related to this type of activity as well. So kind of a, along those, I mean, I, I'm glad actually that you brought up the weight 
uh, aspect. I think, uh, you know, there was a post by uh, Senco on social media a couple weeks ago that had said that on an average day, an SPD technician lifts the equivalent of a car. Uh, just in terms of weight of sets, uh, when you consider that 70% of that, according to, you know, your study, the University of Chicago study, Dr. Nichols study, you know, this is a consistent number that's coming up. Uh, you know, 70% of that weight is absolutely avoidable. Uh, you know, that's a lot of wear and tear on technicians' bodies, especially when we consider, uh, you know, that ties into, worker injuries uh, and those those things so you know this this is becoming a pretty significant s- concern on this i think one thing that you kind of mentioned that we don't really talk about a lot is the footprint or uh, perhaps another way of looking at that is the storage space you know storage space in hospitals is at a premium and so uh, are, are there any sort of numbers that we can tie to you know, how much space is being wasted by unnecessary instrumentation? Well, unfortunately, there's probably not a direct correlation because sometimes, many times from my personal experience, I've seen trays that are just too dense. It should be in a full size. It's in the three-quarter. Even if you optimize or rationalize that tray, you're probably not going to change the footprint. But when you start looking at a specialty type tray that's got 10 different surgeon specialty items inside, when you start looking at breaking it out to a base tray and accessory trays, oh my gosh, we're creating more trays. But at the end of the day, you'll probably gain space by properly sizing those those trays now. And I think the next number as we move on is the one that I found the most surprising, which is 128. And basically, you did a sampling of the instrument inventory and found that 128 different vendors existed amongst this sampling of different instrument sets. And that's a lot of variation, especially for customers that are trying to standardize patterns and reordering and getting that kind of consistency, especially when implementing into a tracking system. Absolutely. I mean, that number, uh, that number is shocking for us as well. Um, just to clarify that, what we'll do is we will take a look at a, a sampling of a customer's uh, inventory. Maybe we'll take a look at their high running sets because these are the ones that really make some sense. You know, high volume, high um, high content sets that make a, make a lot of difference and they're touched and used quite a bit. And we'll take a sampling of that uh, inventory and that's where we've come up with this 128 number. And again, shocked uh, a number that we want to uh, share with folks because it really does uh, kind of add up and make you think, you know, like what do the technicians need to know um, from a standpoint of different vendors, different IFUs, all the different processes that they need to know to keep up to date with this. I mean, we, I think we've even heard on the podcast um, where you've had different folks talking about, um, you know, storage of IFUs, how we manage the IFUs. This becomes more and more uh, difficult with this over time. And even drilling down a little farther, when we've taken a look at just um, certain specialties, for example, the general specialty, we've seen an average of 32 vendors in just that specialty alone. And again, think about that as you're, as, as you're a technician needing to find the IFUs, follow the IFUs, make sure you know the variation between different vendors. It can be uh, pretty onerous. Or, yeah, just even a brand new sterile processing technician trying to put the right instrument pattern into every tray. And again, a lot of times they're looking at make and model number to help them. And we see the use of tape out there in the industry to help sort of cover that learning curve in the early stages. But we know that the Joint Commission is paying a great deal of attention on tape. And so I can see that variation can be a serious challenge to to the different uh, frontline technicians that are getting started. And to your point earlier, utilization of a tracking system, you, you have to make a decision. Do you want primary, secondary, tertiary, even though you may have five or six different manufacturers for a similar item, that becomes problematic as well. But once you take that, make that decision, you also have to maintain that system for you know, three primary vendors for a particular item. And that becomes very arduous for many customers. I think that 
kind of underlying all of this is the elephant in the room that we all know in sterile processing, we have a very significant, you know, turnover problem. Uh, I think I read not too incredibly long ago that the average turnover for certain departments was anywhere in the one year to six months range. Um, you know, this is a real problem in the training of employees. And then, of course, that makes it upstream to the OR. Uh, and, and so I, I think that when we get to the end users, there's a really serious concern about how, you know, how is consistency even possible, especially when, you know, when we use that word consistency, what we're really talking about is standard of care. Uh, you know, and this, this is a patient issue you know this is something that affects the the people on the table and so uh, jay let me just kick it over to you and ask you know is consistency even possible in an environment where you may have 20 or 30 vendors present in a single tray well i think you touch on something really uh, really important there i think consistency it is definitely possible but I think you've got to get to a point where you figure out a way to standardize somehow. And, and I think, you know, there's different ways to standardize, uh, on instruments, right? There's, there's by cost, you know, you can take cheaper ones. Um, you can go by surgeon preference, but that gets expensive or you can do a combination. And, and, and typically that's, that's a, that's an area that we, we suggest, you know, collaboratively working with, uh, surgical staff, um, uh, as well as, uh, instrument professionals to kind of, figure out the right way to standardize. And, and, and once you're able to standardize, this is where you become to get that, that, can, that possibility of consistency. Uh, and you can have that effect on staff, right? So staff without standardizing, they have a lot of variation. Um, manufacturers increase. I have used that to be followed pressure mounts, and then you have errors, right? On, on both time delays. Um, these are all errors and this eventually flows downstream to the OR. Uh, but with standardization on patterns uh, and vendors, um, you can eliminate some of that. The, the burden becomes less. Staff becomes familiar faster. Um, you know, the learning curve decreases. You know, and then when when complexity is reduced, delays and errors can be decreased. So it's it's a you know it's it's something that kind of follows along. And we've had years and years and years of you know surgeon preference purchasing over the years and just adding to sets without taking things out, right? If someone if a surgeon leaves and, and a new surgeon comes in, they just add the new uh, instruments to that set. So this over the years just perpetuates. Um, so we've had a way of causing it, but we now have to figure out a way to get back to it. So the next percentage, this one should maybe scare people a little bit. And I also think that it is one of the underlying causes for overstocking of trays and underutilization. But the percentage is 46%. And I'm just going to say this again, 46%, that's less than half. And this is the number of instruments that are okay for use across your data set, meaning that more than 50% of the instruments are not in ideal condition heading into surgery. That number is shocking. Brian, I don't know if you want to speak to that one first. Certainly. With a lot of our benchmarking step of our, our process, we, we do a sampling of, of customers' trays. And this is one of the first things that we look at. And to what Jay alluded to earlier, we're looking at the fast-moving sets. Those typically have the most attention for preventive maintenance, replacements, things of that nature. So we're trying to be uh, aggressive in the customer's favor when we're doing these reviews. But even with that, we see that 54% of the instruments are either in a state of they need to be replaced because they've either been overutilized, over sharpened. Uh, they're no longer the same instrument anymore. They're in need of repair or there's some level of surface condition which leads to pitting. Um, that's what that other 54% is made up of. Well, pitting is super scary, too, because it's a total cross-contamination issue. I don't think people realize that it's essentially like a cavity in your teeth always and that those pockets can harbor biofilm, which can actually survive sterilization. So there you go. So 46 percent, I'm not saying they're all pitted. Like you said, some could be staining. How many actually do get used? We don't know that, but if we know that over half are not ready for use – 
it's kind of a terrifying number to think about how many might actually be going into the patient's body after they're sent up to the OR. Correct. And unfortunately, you know, some of those items would be scissors, osteotomes, curettes. Um, that's where we see a lot of over maintenance. You know, you get a, a curette that looks more like a key elevator, a nine inch osteotome that's now seven and a half inches. At, at what point is it lo- no longer the same instrument? And that's really what we start seeing a lot of that replace value. And, and we average about a, an 11% replacement value. And that's typically a combination of either over repair and pitting that makes up that 11% of the total in the tray. Yeah, I'm even thinking of a curved osteotome. <laughs> Eventually, the curve is no longer there, right? Correct, especially like a hoke osteotome or a smaller one. You, you run out of material very quickly. With, but also somewhat alarming is 21% of the instruments we've reviewed is in some state of repair. Almost 25% needs to be repaired at some, in some fashion. So let's talk about how much are preventable or caused by poor care and handling practices, right? So we know, especially like with micro instruments, they get damaged really easy if they're not in proper containers. Do you have a sense of how many of these damage types in your study were preventable? Of, of course, 100% are, are preventable, especially through proper care, handling, and inspection. Because uh, the one thing I did fail to, to mention earlier is that every one of the trays that we reviewed in our in our process were sterile ready for use. I'll just further reinforce what Justin said that, you know, this is the number that it really kind of brought the house down there at the issue presentation that when we look at as many as, you know, close to 60 percent of the instruments that we are sending back up to be used on patients are in some way defective, maybe even in, in a minor sense, but nevertheless, they are defective in some sense. You know, that's a huge black eye for our industry. You know, that's a huge problem. And there are multiple, multiple factors that go into that. Uh, you know, it's not just one simple thing that, you know, we can fix. There's cultural issues that are that are in play. Uh, there's turnover issues. There's the vendors. There's the fast training. There's so many things that go into play for that. But I, I think it's clear to say that, you know, if there's 60 percent of instruments that are making it through the prep and pack area with some type of problem, then, there, then you know, that is a huge, uh, you know, emphasis for us to try and improve some things. Uh, And one thing that really kind of caught my attention is is just curious was the fact that, you know, you guys, you operate very heavily in Europe as well as the United States, but you did differentiate between uh, Europe and the United States on one particular issue, and that was surface corrosion. And I noticed that in your data, the U.S. had a pretty significantly higher rate of surface corrosion. And I wanted to get your input. What do you think is the cause of a higher rate of that type of damage within the United States versus our partners over there in Europe? Well, from from my experience in the field is that a lot of that's due to water quality, uh, both water and steam quality, actually. Uh, I will say in recent years, we've seen a focus on reinvestment into the sterile processing department for water treatment systems. But that means you've got the last 25, 30 years of, of inventory that you don't want to discard, but you have to you know, maintain from a value perspective that did not have the, the benefit of, of good quality water. From what we've seen, silicates uh, seems to be a very high contributor, but also chlorine. Um, most you know, U.S. cities chlorinate their water, and chlorine is one of the worst things for stainless steel. Uh, and you combine that with age, different materials in a set, you have a recipe for um, a corrosion fluid. And that's that's contributed to some of the things we've seen in the marketplace. Yeah, and I think the number, uh, according to your research, was as much as 95% uh, of U.S. facilities had some issue in their water quality and their steam quality. And uh, you guys know that one of the biggest challenges – for sterile processing managers is understanding how to make an argument to administration that an investment into their area is financially viable. And one of the places where we see a real challenge for this is water quality because, you know, a a lot of administrators look at steam and they say, what's the big deal? We've got a facility steam boiler uh, steam is steam, so just use the steam that the that facilities is already generating, uh, rather than trying to, you know, install a reverse osmosis generator with 
separated boilers and separated steam feeds, you know, that's really difficult for a sterile processing manager to be able to make that argument uh, to to acquire that capital investment. But I mean, it seems like what your research is saying is that we can use these numbers to help make that argument because if the steam quality and the surface corrosion is leading to a higher rate of damaged instruments, that has a cost attached to it. If the quality cost for acquiring a new steam generator or a new RO water generator is less than the replacement cost of re- preventable repairs, you know, that's the kind of ammunition that we can use to make real changes in our facilities. What are some other ways that you can help us as managers in facilities to take this data and transition it into usable, actionable intel for managers? You know, that's a that's well, a great question and one that we are I think really, really excited about as far as, again, as I mentioned earlier, trying to get this conversation started, getting these things out there, right? So I think this year alone, uh, last time I saw a number on it, there was like 11 or 12 hospitals that had some sort of um, either shut down or some problems due to, you know, there's there's the quote unquote dirty instruments. And, and, and as you guys have seen this in the news, sometimes that's corroded instruments or rusted instruments. And Getting back to your point on cost, you know, that cost for uh, the, the, the new system, it becomes a lot smaller when you start looking at shutdown times and, and things along those lines. So to us, really important is to know what's going on at your facility now, today. What are your numbers? You can probably guarantee that you're going to have some sort of water quality issue, but then how is that being translated to the quality of your instruments? So Get a baseline. That's what we suggest. Get a baseline. Have a have a um, a professional come out and and provide you a baseline of your instrument condition. This is something that uh, that we have begun to do for for our customers because we see this as important. We don't want that to be uh, the situation uh, that that comes about for them. So that's a big area that we suggest. Get a baseline. Find out what your percentages are, and then help fight that. That'll help fight that battle internally for our, our sterile processing professionals. I could not agree more, especially about the statement around baseline. I've gotten so many questions, you know, out there throughout the course of my work where people will say, where's the guideline on this? Or what is the recommendation on this? And as you guys know, there's not a recommendation for everything. There's not a guideline for everything. And when that part is sort of sitting out there and it's unknown, take a baseline and work on trending towards improvement. That's really the best thing you can do at that point. Once you start measuring it, you can definitely start to make some improvements and at least you know what not only your baseline is, but then you can start to set targets and goals and you can have your own recommendations or guidelines that you continue to work to improve. I think that's a great point. And water quality is one of those and steam quality that it just seems like once it grips a facility, they have a really hard time getting out of it. And to the other part of your question, when you're trying to get justification with administration, if you take a step back and you look across, you know, mid-sized hospitals probably have an inventory value at, at $2 million. And they probably have an instrument budget somewhere between two fifty and $400,000 a year. And if you look at that over a five to 10 year period, the compounding value of their inventory is staggering. So to make an investment for sixty dollars or $80,000 that prolongs the life of your instrumentation, potentially reduces the uh, degree of repair that's required, i.e. reconditioning of instrumentation, that's a very self-serving investment for a water system. Now, strategically, you'd probably have to have more of a five-year plan or a 10-year plan if you want to go to clean steam generation, something of that nature. But every facility um, that I've been in is in some way, shape, or form in their depreciation schedule of their current equipment. And there's, there's going to be either a plan or future plans for replacement. If you have that dialogue now with your data from your facility, you can start developing that type of strategy for your next replacement slash upgrade of uh, equipment to, to meet and rectify some of these issues. But water treatment would probably be the first step and usually the most economical. One thing, too, that I wanted to add, and this kind of goes back to just a little bit earlier, but preventable issues with instruments, that comes to the um, you know repair intervals again. So 
you know, we suggest taking a look at repair intervals. So our, you know, our, our experts out there, they're probably utilizing tracking systems. They may or they may not have repair intervals scheduled. Utilization-based versus time-based is something we recommend, but that's a big one too. Because you know, if you're if you're just doing it on a time, but then you have certain instruments or certain trays that are being used more than others, then you start wearing things down, and you're not following the uh, the proper uh, maintenance interval. So I think that's another important one that we can suggest to our listeners as a way to make sure that they can they can keep their quality standards at a good level. No question you want to go utilization or usage-based if you have a tracking system. The variability really narrows down. The ability to have a process improvement whenever you get a complaint is is also really huge, and you can definitely dial your program in much tighter. I could not agree with you more on that statement. Gentlemen, really nice job with the study, really nice dialogue at Isham's annual conference And I really appreciate you sharing this insight with all of our listeners today. Jay, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Really, uh, thank you guys for having us on. And Brian, you as well. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks so much. That was Jay Schrader, Marketing Director, and Brian Stewart, Director of Consulting Services and Field Operations for Ask Your Lab. Great numbers, Mike. I know we kind of went through each one that stood out to us. And I know a little bit of meat on the bone. And after we got done with the interview, you would talk to Jay and Brian about how much you'd like to dive into the differences between the U.S. and Europe on a future podcast. Yeah, the disparities, which they broke that out in a number of their statistics throughout the, the presentation, which we didn't cover you know, extensively just because due to time. But there were a number of disparities throughout uh, just in between the Europe and the United States regarding instrument care. And, you know, I, I really feel like those disparities, you know, have a real dollar figure attached to them. And so, you know, that's something that I feel like us in the U.S. that that puts the onus on us to be able to go out and look at what our partners across the pond are doing differently that might actually be saving a lot of money. Uh, you know, so this is a lot of area for future discussion. I don't think this is the last we'll hear out of Jay and Brian, uh, and I don't think this will be the last time we hear about these really important numbers. So I'm looking forward to the future and what else we can we can learn. Yeah, really important to keep these kinds of statistics out there and for continual review. I'd like to see some trending over time as well. But that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Simply search for Beyond Clean Podcast. We'd appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Mike and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.